Hello, this is Sue with Kentucky Rose Devotionals. It's Monday, we're finding the roses in the Word of God. If you have not yet liked, shared, or subscribed to our channel, please do that. Um, we would love to have you come along with us on this journey, um, studying the Word of God each and every day, just getting it in our heart, meditating um, on the Word, and, and hiding it in our heart so that we don't sin against God. And each day we have the covering of Jesus Christ that we're walking in. If you don't don't know Jesus, if you don't know him as your personal Savior, uh, I invite you today to study his word and find out who he is. This um, scripture that we're going to be looking at today, I call, I'm going to call them the 14s because we're looking at Exodus 14. We're looking at Matthew and Mark 14. Still bear with me, my voice is still um, coming and going, but I'm just thankful to God that he brought me through um, and then I had the opportunity to share the word of God with you today. So I'm um, just keep praying, praying for full healing for me. I'm praying for you as well and I know that um, these have been a, a couple of trying weeks for us with, with sickness here but we're just believing um, that the best is yet to come. And so let's look at Exodus chapter 14 where we're going to see the character of God. We're going to see um, what what God is to us, how he will come so near. If you're wondering, God just seems so far away to me and I don't I don't understand really about him. I don't understand how to read his word, what to do, how to know him. This scripture right here in Exodus 14 will really reveal, reveal to you how close God will get to those who love him, those who serve him. So um, let's look at what the Lord is speaking to Moses here. He's telling uh, Moses to turn the children and to encamp by the sea. So you're going to see some names here mentioned of a place by the sea. They have just gotten out of Egypt. They've come into the wilderness. God is with them. He has been the cloud of day. He has been the pillar of fire by night. And so we're, we're seeing how close God will come to his people, those who will call his name, those will, that, that will do in obedience what he's asking them to do. And, and he's telling, he's warning Moses that Pharaoh is going to once again come against them. He's going to be having that hardened heart. He's going to be regretful now that he ever let them go because he's looking and seeing the disaster that is all around him that is now Egypt. And he is angry. And so he's going to come at them um, with all his host, it says. Um, and so uh, as we look at verse 6, you're going to see him making the chariots ready, choosing 600 men to come after the children of Egypt um, and pursue the children. And it says that went out from the high hand of Pharaoh. Um, so the Egyptians pursued them, it says, the horses, the chariots, Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and he overtook them camping by the sea. But yet as he came near, God was there. God was there standing in the gap against the enemy, which is what God does for us. Um, as you see here, it says, Pharaoh drew nigh, the children lifted up their eyes, and they saw, instead of seeing the pillar of cloud of God, and seeing the Lord surrounding them, they got their eyes on the enemy. And they lifted up their eyes, and they saw the Egyptians, and immediately fear went into their heart. This is much like for any of us today when we're facing the enemy or we're facing difficult situations in our life and we're coming um, up against the enemy and we're looking at what is what we think is the reality. We're looking at the facts. We're looking at the report. We're seeing, you know, the fear that maybe rises up from getting a bad report or the fear that rises up from from getting bad news um, or we, the fear that rises up from something that might be taking place in our life whether it's financially um, whether it might be a, a family member whatever the case may be we we're looking with our eyes we're looking visually with our eyes seeing something that makes us afraid because we're looking at it through our eyes instead of looking at it through the eyes of God and so the children instead of reacting with faith react with fear and the fear turns to complaining as we see here at verse 11 Moses said and they're, and they're saying to Moses they're complaining to Moses and saying you know were there not enough graves for us in Egypt what we could have died in Egypt we could have been fine there we could have stayed behind in Egypt and and done what we had to do there why did you bring us out here to the wilderness to die here 
this is this is what you've done and they were complaining is this is not this the word that we did tell you in Egypt let us alone that we could serve the Egyptians because it would be better that we should serve them than to die here in the wilderness so basically they're saying we prefer our old life we prefer the old bondage over what this this new life is going to bring because this new life looks like it's going to be death for us here so um, sometimes this is this is the thoughts of the enemy that comes in our mind. It's easier to go back to your old life. It's easier to go back to what you used to be. It's easier to do these things that you used to do rather than get on this new path that God has outlined for you because this new path is difficult. It's hard. It's the road less traveled. And so the enemy is going to make everything that you used to be look wonderful when in reality all that was bringing to you was death. And the same thing is true here for the Israelite children. They're seeing this, that, that they think that what was back there looks better than what's in front of them. They're not seeing what's in front of them. So let's look. Let's look and see what's in front of them. Moses said to the people, he encourages them in the Lord. And this is what we need in our moments of weakness, in our moments of doubt, in our moments of fear, going through the difficulties that we're going through right now. We need someone to stand up and encourage us in the Lord, whether that be ourselves encouraging ourselves in the Word of God, as David did, or someone just coming to us and saying, now I want to give you a word of encouragement. Here, here is Moses doing just that. He says, fear not. Stand still. And when you stand still, You'll really hear the voice of God. You'll really know the truth. You will not get caught up in the lies of the enemy. You instead will focus on the voice of God. What is God saying? He's saying, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord and that I'm going to show you today. For the Egyptians that you are seeing today, you're not going to see them again after today. This this enemy, this bondage, this crippling sin, this crippling disease, all of these things that you see with your eyes, you're not going to see them anymore as you place your complete trust, your complete confidence in the God of your salvation, the one who tells you to fear not, the one that tells you to stand still, not to turn around and go back to what you used to be, but to go forward in what he has for you at, in this future. The Lord, he said, is going to personally fight for you. He's going to fight for you, and all you have to do is hold your peace. Sounds like a great exchange to me. Stand still. Don't be afraid. I'm going to fight this battle for you. All you have to do is hold your peace in God. Keep your peace. Don't let the enemy steal your peace today. Don't let him do that. He does it when we fear. He does it when we doubt. He does it when we complain against God. Instead of praising God. Instead of thanking God. Instead of moving forward into what God has for us. The Lord said unto Moses, why, why are you crying unto me? Speak to the children of Israel and go forward. Don't stand here crying out to me. I'm here. I am here is what God was telling Moses. Go forward. I'm right here with you. I'm in this battle with you. You are not alone. I'm fighting for you. So he says, lift up your rod. Stretch out your hand. Basically, take up the tools that you had that I've blessed and speak and divide that sea. And the children of Israel are going to walk forward on dry ground. I've made a way for you. I've made an impossible escape for you. Is what God did here. He says, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians. They're going to come after you. They're going to follow you. But when they do, I'm going to take care of it. The Egyptians are going to know that I'm God. That I'm the Lord. That I will be the one who will get all the honor, all the glory out of the situation. And look at verse 19. You want to know how close God is or how close he will get? Look at verse 19. The angel of God, which went before the camp. So the angel of God's in front of them. Um, the camp of Israel. It, it, he says he removed and then he went behind them. And the pillar of cloud, which is God went from before their face and stood behind them. So they've got the angel of the Lord in front of them and the Lord behind them. And then they're going to have the walls of the sea surrounding them. So God had them on every single side. But could they see it? No, they couldn't see that God had their front and their back. They could see the sides, but they felt, they felt like they were exposed on the front and the back and were not exposed. Why? Because today I hope that you've put on, as a child of God, your armor. That you put on your breastplate of righteousness. There's no room for a back plate 
Because we're not supposed to be turning around. We're supposed to be going forward in, in what God has blessed us with. We've got the angel of God going with us. We've got the Lord surrounding us on all sides. And it says, It came when the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, there was a cloud of darkness on the side of the Egyptians. They could not see through. They could not see through God. They could not see the light, which is Jesus Christ. But it was light, it says, on the side where the children of Israel was. God wasn't only taking them through and carrying them from the back, but he was shining a light for them to walk forward. He was showing the path. What does God's word say? Thy word is a light unto my path. A light. When we read God's word, it illuminates what path we need to take. People will tell you to go down a lot of roads that aren't the road God wants you to go down today. So I want to encourage you. Let the word of God light the path. If you're looking for answers, if you're looking for solutions, if you're looking for, God, which way do you want me to go? Open the word of God and he will illuminate your path and make it clear today. So he says here that Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind. He blew his breath. God actually just blew his breath and blowed back the sea. This is our God. This is the power of God. And he made the sea uh, move back, and the land was dry, and the waters were divided. And the children went through. They went through. We're going to go through. We're going to make it. We're going to go through on dry ground. And those walls around them, surrounding them on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued, and they went in after him. The enemy thought they, he was going to catch them. He thought he was going to get them. He thought he was going to do them harm. But God had their back, and he had their front. And he had the side. Praise God. God has us surrounded like a shield. He's got us protected. The shield in the front, the sides, the back. He had it all covered. He's got you covered today. So it says, As it came to pass that night, watch, the Lord looked into the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud, and he troubled them. He troubled the host. They were scared so much so it says that the Lord himself took off the chariot wheels and he drove them heavily. He drove them away from his people. And the Egyptian says, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fights for them. Do you know you can have such a power of God around you, surrounding you, that the enemy knows he can't touch you because God is in the midst. He is moving. He is taking care of you. So the Lord says to Moses, stretch out your hand on the sea and, and the waters are going to come again. And when these waters come down, all that have pursued you, all that have continued on, even after I warned them to go, those who continue to pursue you, that, that enemy that continues to not want to let go of you, he will let go because he's going to drown in the midst of the sea is what God tells him here. He overthrows the Egyptians and the waters return. They cover the chariots, the horsemen, and there was not one left, the Bible says at verse 28. Not one of them was left that pursued God's people. And the same is true today. Those who persecute God's people, those who try to come against Israel, they will not prevail because God is in the midst of them. Just as God has grafted us in to this wonderful family tree, which is this tree of Israel, as Christians, um, we come together with them. We believe. We bind the enemy in Jesus' name. And the children of Israel walked, it says. They walked. They didn't have to run. They didn't have to be afraid. They walked on the land in the midst of the sea with God behind the angel of the Lord in front and the water on the side. And the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, it says. And Israel saw with their own eyes. At first they saw the enemy. At first they had fear rise up. But when they saw through the eyes of God and saw what God would do, how he would fight for them, how he would be close to them, so close that he was right at their back, when they felt that power and saw the demonstration of God, it says the people feared the Lord. They didn't fear the enemy. They feared the Lord. They reverenced him. They worshiped him. They honored him. They believed the Lord, it says, and his servant Moses. Thank God for this powerful word today, that God is near, that he encamps around those who are his. Praise God. So let's look at Matthew 15 or 14. I'm sorry. 
We're going to see several things happen here, and I'm not going to cover it all and read every scripture to you, but I want to encourage you to do that. Um, and, and just, again, study out, meditate out what God is speaking to you through this passage, just like I just did. I took each passage, and I, I, and I looked at what God is saying to me through that, and that, that's the way to study God's Word. That's the way to understand it. Look at each passage. Look at what's happening. What are you saying to me about you, God, through this, through this Word? So we see the time of Herod here. We see the, the death of John the Baptist, uh, which, is, uh, which was a horrible death for him. Uh, but it was, it was part of God's plan. We, this is the hard thing for us to see. You know, God's plan in this. Why did John have to die this way? Why did Herodias, this evil woman who had multiple husbands um, and doing evil in the sight of God, how did she um, get this to happen? This was part of God's timing. It was part of his plan that John decreased and that Jesus' ministry increased. There were many who were following John that needed to steer toward Jesus and, and doing the things that were going to promote the kingdom of God. Not that John's disciples weren't. They were. They were promoting the things of God. But sometimes people want to follow a person instead of following Jesus. And so Jesus had to increase, and John had to decrease. And so we see um, his death here. We see um, him being beheaded because of a young girl's whim uh, and a mother's prompting behind the scenes. And, and you know, we, we can see things like this today. We can see evil people with evil intentions pushing people in directions that they're not supposed to go and they're not supposed to do, but they're being pushed by spirits they're being pushed by demonic forces who are trying to keep a young man or a young woman from the real promise that God has for them instead they're being pushed and they're forced into these situations with people who don't have their best interests at heart people who are after things that that are not after the heart of God they're after money or they're after a uh, position or they're after um, placement. But they're not after the things of God, and they don't really love that person. They're just after what they can suck out of that person. And, and that's what the devil will do. He will suck the life out of you. And, and we're seeing this across our nation. We see people who are being led and guided by evil spirits. They're being led and guided by people who are not after the heart of God. They're after everything but God. The world is what they're after. If we look at, um, continue on here, the disciples came, they took John's body, and they buried it, and they went and told Jesus um, what was happening. When Jesus heard this, this was this was a, a big hurt to Jesus. He loved John. Um, this is his cousin. And so um, this ship is going to a desert place. Jesus is getting away to the desert place. He needs a moment with the Father because he knows what this is going to mean for his ministry. That his ministry is going to be sped up. Um, and that his his time has come. That his time to do uh, the remarkable, the amazing, the extraordinary. This is this is his time now. But yet, with great sorrow, um, he 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 thinks of John and and what John has sacrificed and what he has done to prepare the way for him. And so he goes forth and he sees the multitude. The multitude follows. This is how how much people wanted to get to Jesus. They were following on foot beside the ship following where Jesus was going. They didn't care how far they had to travel. They knew that where Jesus was, there was peace, there was healing, there was miracles, there was provision. So they wanted to be where Jesus was. And the same thing is true for you today. There, You can find all those things in God. You can't find them in this world. You can't find them in people. But you can find them in Jesus. And so they went forth and it says that Jesus was moved with compassion compassion. Jesus loved them. He saw their needs and he healed their sick, the Bible says. And when he came that evening to that desert place um, and the time had passed, the multitudes were about to go away and Jesus didn't want to send them away empty-handed because he knew how far they traveled. He knew what a long day it had been for him and them. And he, he said, give them something to eat. Of course, the disciples are looking around saying, we have nothing except these five loaves and two fishes, a little boy's lunch. But this little lunch, he said, Jesus said, bring it to me. Just as he says to you today, bring what you have to me. Well, I don't have much to offer. It doesn't matter what you have. Your little is much with Jesus. So he says, bring it to me. Then I don't care what you have to do. 
bring what you have to me. And he commanded them to sit down on the grass, it says. He provided grass in the desert. This is Jesus. Grass in the desert, taking these loaves and looking up toward heaven, the Bible says, blessing it, blessing what we give to him, breaking it, and giving it back to those who gave it to him, the disciples, and the disciples gave it to the multitude. God blesses us. He has to break us at times to present us to the world, to present the gospel to those who are hungry and thirsty and needing a Savior today. We go through different obstacles. We go through different hardships. But God will remain faithful to us as we remain faithful to Him in the blessing, in the breaking. He's there. He is faithful to us. It says everyone did eat. And what I find remarkable is not only did they eat, but they were filled, the Bible says. When you eat from Jesus' table, you're full. You're going to get what you need. You're satisfied. And in fact, there were 12 baskets of fragments that were left over here. So not only does God give you what you need, He gives you more than enough. He provides beyond what you could ever imagine. And they, they ate, it says about 5,000 men besides women and children, which would have probably added up to somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to 12,000 people that were fed that day. So God moved, and he walks on the water here. And the disciples you're going to see are afraid because they think he is a ghost. But Jesus says to them, be of good cheer. It is I. You don't have to be afraid. Just as we've heard God speak in Exodus, he's speaking here again in Matthew. Do not be afraid. It is I. I am here. I'm closer than you think I am. I am here today. Peter answered him, Lord, if it be you, bid you come to me. I, I, bid me to come. I want to walk on water, Peter says. I don't want to just sit here in the ship and watch you, but I want to get out of the boat and do something that I, that I know is impossible with the one that I know can make it possible. So Peter steps out because Jesus says, come. Jesus commanded. Peter responds to that command. He can't help it because when Jesus says something, it's done, isn't it? So he comes. He steps out of the ship. He steps out onto the water. And the Bible says that he saw the wind. He was doing just fine. Walking toward Jesus, but he sees the wind, and he he lets fear rise up, just as the children let the fear rise up. Here, here Peter is letting it rise up, and Jesus immediately, it says, stretches forth his hand as Peter begins to sink, because Jesus heard three words. He heard Peter say, Lord, save me. Now, you may be feeling like Peter today. You've tried to walk with Jesus, but the storms have gotten howling so bad in your life that you feel like that you're sinking, that you feel like that you're going nowhere. You feel like you don't, There's. it's impossible. There's no way out of this situation. What am I going to do? It's solved with three simple words. Lord, save me. When he spoke those words, Jesus was right there immediately to stretch out his hand and to pull him up and catch him up with him and say, why didn't you believe me? Why didn't you just keep your eyes fixed on me? Why did you look at the storm? Why did you have such little faith and confidence? I'm right here with you. The Son of God is right here with you. But he, but he said to him, what? What did he say to the storms? Peace be still. The winds calm. The winds cease. When Jesus spoke these words of, why did you, why were you afraid? I'm the creator of the universe. I'm the one who spoke everything into existence. I'm the one that commands the wind and the waves. All you had to do was do what you just did. Lord, save me. Lord, I trust in you. You're here with me. Just keep on walking. But they got in the ship, and as they got in the ship, the disciples did a wonderful thing. They worshipped God. What could you do but worship to witness such a sight as the Son of God walking on water in front of your eyes? All they could do was say, oh, be in amazement. Only God can do these things. You are truly the Son of God. This is a revelation that they had in their worship. When you worship God, He'll reveal Himself to you, won't He? When you worship Him for who He is, He will show you who He is. When you do that, it's by faith that we worship God. It's by faith that we walk toward Him and believe that He's going to take care of the needs. And we see that He goes back 
to Gennesaret. And Gennesaret is where the man possessed with the demons was. Remember this? Okay, and I told you that Jesus would come back here. This time, instead of being met with fear and people telling him to go, get back on the ship, don't come here. The people welcomed him and spread the word about, it says. And all that were diseased were brought to Jesus. And look what it says he did here at verse 36. And besought him that they might only touch the hem. There, see, it is back there. The hem of his garment. And as many as touched were made perfectly whole. Will you touch the hem of God's garment today? Will you touch Jesus with your faith? Will you cry out in your desperate situation, Lord, save me? I dare you to. I dare you to, to ask God to intervene in your situation right now. God, save me. When you cry out those three words, He's there. He will be faithful. He will see you through all the difficult and trying situations of your life. And He'll see you through the most wonderful times of your life. He will be a constant, faithful friend. He's not like people who are only around you when you have something to offer them. And, and I've been there. Um, my husband and I have both been there. We've, we've been in a, a season in our life where we were at without um, all of the things that we used to have. And we went through about 18 months of that. Um, where people who used to be friends never called. And people who used to reach out to us to want to use us, never, never the phone never rang from them. But those who were true friends, those who really loved us, were those who kept reaching out to us saying, Are you okay? Can, can we use you at our church? Um, we want to be a blessing to you. Um, and, and they opened up doors for us that God laid in their heart. And the Lord took care of us and provided for us. As we were being faithful to God, we continued to pay our tithes. We paid them beyond what we had paid before. That's how good God is. When you will be faithful to Him, He will carry you through the difficult moments. He will show you who is real. He will show you who really loves you in, in the desperate moments of your life, who's there for you, um, that doesn't turn away from you, but is there faithfully to you. God will show you who, who your real friends are. But I'm going to tell you, there was one friend that stuck closer than any friend I had, and that was Jesus. He was there. He was faithful. Every bill was paid. Every need was met. As I was faithful, Faithful to him, he gave me faithfulness. As I was obedient to him, he came to me and, and provided the provision that I needed. Each and every time, he's never failed me. And he won't fail you today, I promise. As you look at this final chapter, Matthew 14, in your daily reading, you're going to see the plot to kill Jesus. You're going to see the anointing of Jesus at Bethany with Mary, pouring out her alabaster box, giving God everything. He wants it all. Just as we saw the children of Israel turn to God and give them all his worship. Give them all the worship that he's due. Then we saw the same here. The disciples in the boat worshiping God, giving them all they had. Because of the sight that they saw that he was doing in front of their eyes. But will you worship him when you see nothing? Will you worship him like Mary when everybody in the room is putting you down for doing what you're doing? Making fun of you. Saying, why did she waste this money on God? Why would you give your tithe to the church when you know you need it to do this or you need it to do that? Will you pour out as Mary did and give God your everything? Not just pouring out financially to the Lord, but pouring out to Him with your heart, with your total surrender today to Him. This is what Mary did. And Jesus scolded everybody who made fun of her in the room. He took up for Mary here. And he'll take up for you and me one day as we stand before God and our false accuser comes into the room to try to put us down. Jesus will say, oh no, wait a minute. My blood covers her. My blood covers him. He is mine. She is mine. You cannot touch them. You cannot bring up their past. I erased it. I took care of it. This is what Jesus has done for you. So as you look at this, it says that her gospel, the gospel of what she did, the love that she poured out to Jesus was going to be remembered as a memorial. And it was. It was written and recorded in four of the gospels. All four. All four of them record the story of Mary pouring out her alabaster box. And this moment is what pushes Judas, the money keeper, over the edge. He was greedy and he didn't like Mary pouring out her love on Jesus and, and, and wasting what he thought was money that should have been given to him and put in his purse 
to take with him. So this shows us the heart of Judas here. He, he was the money keeper, and in that role, he became greedy. He became concerned with nothing but his own wants and his own needs, which is what people do that love money more than God. Money's not the problem. It's the love of the money that's the problem. There are people who are concerned more with possessions and things than they are about doing the things of God. And so that's what Jesus was up against here. He was up against Judas who was selling him out because Judas wanted money. He didn't want, want Jesus. He didn't want the things of God. He wanted money. And money, you see what money got Judas in the end. It, it got him death is what it got him. It got him um, shame. Um, so much shame that he couldn't live with it. That he, he wanted to end his life. And if he had just turned to Jesus, it could have ended so differently for Judas. If he had just repented like Peter did. Peter, Peter did wrong, but he came back to God. He realized his wrong, and he made up for it in, in leaps and bounds and died for Jesus. He died upside down, crucified upside down for the Lord. Um, so he gave it all. He poured it all out. Like Mary poured it all out. Peter may have made some mistakes along the way. He wasn't perfect. But when he decided to sell out to God and totally live for him and was empowered by the Holy Spirit, he was the first one to preach on the day of Pentecost with boldness the word of God. He would not deny Jesus again. In fact, he would scream out on that cross upside down, oh, thank you, God, that I get to die in, in such a way that I get to honor you with my life, that I get to die for you, Lord. There is no greater love than this, that I get to lay down my life because you laid down yours for me. And I get to give it back. I get to give my life back to you, Jesus. What a way to go. So this is a powerful portion of scripture. I hope you enjoy reading the rest of Mark. Um, chapter 14. Looking at Peter's denial. But also realizing that, that he's going to come back. That Jesus has prayed for Peter. And that he's prayed that he won't fail. Because he knew he would not fail. Because he had the power of God. He had the backing of God. He had the, the revelation of who God was to be able to say, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Nothing can take that revelation away from you. Once you realize who Jesus is, there's no demon in hell that can snatch that out of your hand unless you let it. So today, I want to encourage you to keep walking in the Word. Keep looking at um, the book of Mark. Uh, you're going to see the arrest of Jesus. You're going to see him brought before the Sanhedrin. You're going to see him brought before the high priest Caiaphas. And you're going to see the denial, but yet the repentant heart of Peter. That's what we don't see in Judas. That was what was missing. Judas didn't have that repentant heart. He was only sorrowful when he was caught in what he was doing. But he wasn't sorrowful enough to turn to Jesus and repent. He was just sorrowful enough for what he did that he 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 let the devil take him over. Um, and, and that's what happened with him. So this is a powerful display of scripture here. The, the redemption that is available for us through Christ. The, the, the love of Jesus. That even those that were coming against him. That, that one of the soldiers when Peter got upset and cut his ear off. Jesus put it right back on and healed this man. A man that was coming to take him to his death. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is mercy. Jesus is grace. Jesus is forgiveness. Jesus is love. Jesus is uh, the servant to us who laid down his life in the condition that you are. He died for you. He died to set you free. He died to make you whole today. Will you receive him? Will you walk forward with him? Will you do as Mary and pour out all your love on him today? Because he's worthy. Just because of who he is, not because of what he's done for you. Even though he's done more for us than we can ever imagine. Just dying for us is enough. But he's done so much. What will you give him in return? You know what the, the poem says. It just says, what can I give him? I want to give him my heart. That's what God wants. He wants your heart today. He wants you to give your life for him. To give everything up. Whether that be giving up people who are pulling you in the wrong direction. Whether that be giving up things, places, jobs. Going where he wants you to be. Being in his will. That's the only place that in the middle of the storm, there's peace when you're in his will. God bless you today. I'll see you soon.